Hi there, Why Religion friends. Professor Anthony Sweat here from BYU's Department of Church History and Doctrine. Welcome to another great episode of the Why Religion podcast, our last episode of the 2022 calendar year. You won't be disappointed by this finale episode. When I teach my BYU students about the first vision, I focus part of the class on the line from the 1838 account where God says that the modern creeds of Christianity are, quote, an abomination in his sight, end of quote. Then I put up on the screen what is known as the Apostles' Creed, an early Christian text from its first centuries, and have them read it all the way through, which most of them never have, by the way, looking for what they agree with and what may be abominable to them. It's nice and short, and so since I assume that most listeners have never read it, I'm going to read an English translation of it here for you right now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, it's not too bad, is it? In fact, after reading it, my students will usually say that they agree with about 90% of it, an A-. And as a side note, while I have you, there are doctrinal developments in other creeds that we could rightly to say deserve an abominable failing grade. But this early statement of faith matches most of our modern beliefs. I share this creed because while we often think that the record of early Christians falls silent after the New Testament, some may be surprised to know that there is abundant information of the lives and faith and sacrifices of these earliest believers for centuries, which is often overlooked by Latter-day Saints. BYU's Dr. Jason Combs from the Department of Ancient Scripture specializes in this world of early Christianity and has recently edited a really impactful new publication called Ancient Christians, an Introduction for Latter-day Saints. Uh, So I was just surprised uh, to learn that there was so much information out there that that early Christians had written so much. And um, I fell in love with with reading uh, their words and and uh, and exploring all that they had to teach us. In today's episode, Professor Jason Combs will help these early Christians indeed teach us as he opens us up to their world and worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ryan Sharp of BYU Ancient Scripture sat down to interview his colleague, Professor Jason Combs, to discuss his publication on ancient Christians. In part one, he will look at why he did this publication, providing an overview of the volume and how it came about. He will specifically discuss his introductory chapter on understanding ancient Christians, simplifying three eras of Christian history as the triumph, the decline, and the varieties of Christianity, analyzing LDS thinking into each of these three epics. 
All right, we're here to talk about a volume that you were one of the editors on entitled Ancient Christians, an Introduction for Latter-day Saints. And while we typically reserve the more personal questions for the final segment of the interview, you've been on once before, yeah. and I thought it might be helpful to just remind our listeners of some of your background and training, because right. it definitely will inform the, the conversation. Yeah, sounds good. So you completed your bachelor's degree from uh, Brigham Young University in Near Eastern Studies, a master's degree from Yale University Divinity School in bib- Biblical Studies with a major area of New Testament, and then a second master's from Columbia University in Classics, and your PhD from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in Religious Studies, majoring in Ancient Mediterranean Religions with an emphasis on the history of early Christianity. So yeah, suffice nice. it to say, you have something uh, to, to say about what we're discussing. You talk about this book as an outgrowth of the shared interest of the editors and authors. Uh, as one of the editors, maybe spend a few minutes giving us an overview of the volume, and then also tell us the story about how it came about. How did you bring all these people together? Yeah, so uh, I had a book like this in mind from the time I arrived at BYU. Um, I'd seen books published by Richard Holtzoffel and others titled Jehovah and the World of the Old Testament, and another titled Jesus Christ and the World of the New Testament. And these were wonderful books full of images and and good scholarship that that helped Latter-day Saints to really understand those worlds in which our scriptures were written. And I thought, wow, why why not do a follow-up to that, uh, Jesus Christ in the world after the New Testament? So right away, I knew I wanted to bring Christian Heal into this. He's an expert in ancient uh, uh, Syriac Christianity, in Syrian Christianity, uh, in the language of Syriac. Um, uh, I want to bring uh, Mark Ellison and, and Catherine Taylor into this, who both specialize in early Christian art. And because they were both part of this, the, the, this volume is beautiful. It's, it's full of these rich images from the early history of Christianity. So in this volume, um, after, after my introduction, which we'll talk about in just a minute, we have chapters in there on uh, preaching Christ. So how ancient Christians uh, read their scriptures and then shared those scriptures and sermons and how they interpreted them. We have a chapter on canon, on, on how the Bible came to be and how it was shaped by authority and by debates over what to include in Scripture. There's a chapter in there on the organization of the church, how the church developed a hierarchical organization, and on women's roles within that. Uh, We have a chapter on sacred space, uh, how churches came to be. Originally, Christians met in people's homes because there weren't too many of them, but eventually they built these beautiful churches with, with art. And and then what? How did the how did Christians worship in those spaces? We have another chapter on that on early Christian rituals and worship. We have a chapter on human nature uh, that focuses on the creation of humankind and the fall and what early Christians had to say about that. And then I have another chapter in here on the divine nature, on how Christians came to understand the nature of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, we have a chapter on the atonement and how Christians understood that, on on becoming like God, on on work for the dead. Uh, when we think of work for the dead today, we typically think of of primarily of the work that we do in temples. Uh, but early Christians, although they did some Christ, early Christians did have a notion of baptism for the dead, uh, they expanded their notion of work for the dead to include things like. How do you how do you care for deceased members of the church? Uh, what do you do when you go to their grave site? And so we have a beautiful chapter on that with lots of artwork. Um, uh, there's a chapter on on living in the afterlife. Uh, what what early Christians understood about heaven, hell, and places in between. Uh, and then the book concludes with a chapter on. Uh, facing the end on the second coming of Jesus Christ in the millennium. We also have an afterword uh, written by Miranda Wilcox on uh, Christians beyond the period we're talking about. This book primarily focuses on the first six centuries. Some go up into the seventh or eighth century of Christianity. And so we wanted one more chapter in here to say, okay, well, what about Christians afterward? Is is there anything we can learn about Christians from the period that, that we call the medieval period or Middle Ages? Uh, and so Miranda Wilcox has a wonderful chapter that, that and afterward in the book that wraps it up and talks about that. So that's that's a little about what the book is and and how it came to be. Yeah, that's really helpful. And 
uh, I have to tell you, as I was reading through it, I was hesitant to even mark the book because it was so beautiful. Uh, you you and, and your group there has done an incredible job in putting this together. And I will say to our listeners as well, stay tuned because there will be a couple of other interviews forthcoming um, detailing a couple of these chapters outlined by Jason in this conversation. So as we mentioned, not only are you one of the editors, you also have a couple of pieces in this volume. Uh, the first chapter you mentioned was the introduction, and it's entitled Understanding Ancient Christians, Apostasy, and Restoration. And in this chapter, you explain that writing this history of ancient Christianity is complex. And over the past 2,000 years, it's been told in so many different ways. And so in the first part of the chapter, you try to simplify these different approaches and categorize them into three different narratives. Uh, I, I realize it's unfair to ask you to do this, but can you just give a brief summary of each of these three approaches? Yeah, I, I don't know how brief I can be, but, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, so I, I categorize these three approaches as as the triumph of Christianity, that's the first one, the decline of Christianity, and then varieties of Christianity. And these three approaches have been used at different times uh, throughout history. The triumph of Christianity is really the earliest approach in which Christian history is told. We see this approach already in the New Testament book of Acts. Uh, Acts begins with uh, Jesus teaching his apostles after his resurrection. And just before he ascends up into heaven, he tells them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that they will preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and unto the ut uttermost part of the earth. And the book of Acts is then shaped around that uh, triumphal promise. Uh, it shows how the gospel begins to be taught in Jerusalem and in all Judea. Then it moves on by Acts chapter 8 to Samaria. And then after that, after Peter's uh, vision and his encounter with uh, the Gentile Cornelius and the spirit that comes upon their family, the gospel moves to Gentiles and then goes to the uttermost parts of the earth through the preaching of Paul. Uh, other Christians, long after the book of Acts, for example, uh, Eusebius, who's writing in the early 4th century, around 324 AD, uh, Eusebius is considered the father of, of Christian history. He has a very similar narrative. He starts from the time of Jesus and takes Christian history all the way up to his own time. And the way that he narrates it, he acknowledges that sometimes there are apostates, sometimes there are heretics, sometimes there are people who are teaching false doctrine, but he shows how uh, the church continues triumphant despite these these uh, encounters with with apostates. Uh, for instance, in, in one narrative, he tells how there's this bishop who uh, is led astray by this false idea that Jesus is merely human and not divine, and he becomes he becomes a bishop of a heretical sect. And then uh, he experiences a vision, a, a dream in which he's chastised by an angel throughout the night. And the very next day, he then repents of his false belief and returns to the true church, uh, recants his misguided views, and is accepted back in. And so Eusebius has story after story like this, where the church continues to progress despite detractors and despite uh, other problems. Now, if we jump forward a thousand years after that, we get to a new version of Christian history, and this is the version that I call the decline of Christianity. This actually begins in the early 1400s uh, with European humanists. European humanists uh, in this period, this is the beginning of the period that we call the Renaissance, uh, they're reviving classical styles of art and literature. And what they claimed is that they were restoring civilization from a millennium of cultural darkness. They're suggesting that people prior to them had fallen away from the true classical forms of literature and art and that they were restoring that. So they depicted people who lived in this period prior to them as living in a period of dark ages, a period of, of barbarism and superstition, and that they were restoring the proper uh, way of doing art and literature. So they really invented a model of time that divided history into three distinct periods, an ancient and classical era, then this Middle Ages or Dark Ages, and then the period that they were giving birth to, the Renaissance and modern periods. 
Now, a hundred years after that, Protestant reformers pick up on this narrative and use it to tell the history of Christianity. They argued that the church itself had fallen into a period of darkness and needed a restoration. And yes, they use the term restoration. It's only later that we uh, come to describe this as the Protestant Reformation. Uh, for some, the original purity of the church had, had lasted up until the time of the Roman Emperor Constantine, around 300. Others argued that it lasted until after the Christianization of England, around 600 to 700. But they argued that eventually uh, the truth of the church, its original purity, had become corrupted and fell away and that they needed to restore it and that that's what the Protestant Reformation was doing. Now, jump forward another uh, several hundred years into our modern period, and we now have a new approach that I, I have called the varieties of Christianity approach. Now, this is relatively recent. Uh, for years, Protestant scholars and Catholic scholars, for that matter, had inherited this apostasy narrative, and that affected their scholarship. Uh, in fact, it had become a common argument that Christianity's decline was caused by Greek and Roman culture creeping into an originally pure church and corrupting it. Uh, some argued, for example, that Greek philosophy corrupted the Christian notion of God or that pagan religious practices corrupted early Christian practices. Uh, historians today have come to realize that this narrative of philosophical and pagan corruption is far too simplistic to be an accurate representation of historical events. Uh, the early Christian church was not corrupted by Greek and Roman culture. In fact, Greek and Roman culture had already been around uh, in, in that Jews had been engaging with Greek and Roman culture already for hundreds of years. In fact, they had been engaging with Greek and Roman culture longer than the United States of America has existed as a country. Uh, so so uh, scholars have realized that you can't argue that that it was only after the time of Jesus, after the time of New Testament, that suddenly Greek and Roman culture crept in and corrupted things. That, that's simply not the case. Um, in fact, uh, in, in 1978, the First Presidency issued this statement where they acknowledged that philosophers, including Socrates, Plato, and others, received a portion of God's light. This is, a, this is a direct quote from them here. Philosophers, including Socrates, Plato, and others, received a portion of God's light. Moral truths were given to them by God to enlighten whole nations and bring a higher level of understanding to individuals. So we should be hesitant to just automatically dismiss anything in early Christianity that seems like it might be uh, related to, say, the philosophy of Plato. Uh, because Plato himself had a portion of God's light and, and taught things that were true. So we need to take each, each teaching on its own terms and not immediately dismiss it because it might have some similarity to, to ancient teachings of, of philosophers, right? I want to share an excerpt from this section and then maybe get you to comment a little further on it. You write, the blessings of restored and new scripture, including the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine of Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, as well as the revelations and words of modern prophets and apostles, do not require us to dismiss the inspired insights of ancient Christians or even other modern Christians. Too often, rather than rejoicing in the blessings and purposes of the restoration, uh, we members of the church rejoice that we are not like others. Help us understand what you have in mind here and perhaps some recommendations on how we can be both more careful and also ways in which we can underscore the unique contributions of the restoration. Yeah, I think we need to be careful in how we think about what it means to be called by God, right? Uh, we absolutely believe that God has called us to do a great work, and we should rejoice in that. That is wonderful. But just because God has called us to do a great work doesn't mean God has called us to pat ourselves on the back and congratulate ourselves for being called. Uh, God hasn't called us to congratulate ourselves. God has called us to serve, to go forth and serve. And so we, we need to think about how we relate to other churches because of that. For, for instance, um, well, let me just read you this, this passage. Um, this is a, a quotation from... Um, President Ezra Taft Benson, uh, he was quoting at the time another uh, earlier apostle, Elder Orson F. Whitney. Uh, here's what he had to say. Uh, God, the Father of us all, uses the people of the earth, especially good people, to accomplish his purposes. It has been true in the past. It is true today. It will be true in the future. 
Perhaps the Lord needs such people on the outside of the church to help it along, said late Orson F. Whitney of the Quorum of the Twelve. God is using more than one people for the accomplishment of his great and marvelous work. The Latter-day Saints cannot do it all. It is too vast, too arduous for any one people. I love that quote. Um, in fact, uh, part of that quotation was uh, read to us again just recently in the October 2022 General Conference. Uh, President Oaks quoted part of this in his talk uh, titled Helping the Poor and the Distress. And right after quoting that part from Elder Orson F. Whitney, he said, we need to be more aware and more appreciative of the service of others. So rather than approaching our relationship to other Christian churches by by despising them or by contrasting the best parts of our church with the worst parts of other churches, uh, perhaps we should look on them with uh, what Christer Stendhal has described as holy envy. Uh, Christer Stendhal was um, a uh, uh, Protestant minister uh, and uh, also a New Testament scholar who taught at Harvard University. And in, in a time when the church was trying to get a temple built in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, uh, there was a lot of pushback from the, from the people there. And Christer Stendhal, uh, who was living there at the time, actually stood up and said, we need to, we need to um, show holy envy. Uh, and by that, what he meant was um, we need to appreciate beliefs that other Christians have that we do not ourselves hold in our own faith traditions, uh, but that we might have a little bit of envy for, that we might appreciate. And he was speaking in particular about the the work that we as Latter-day Saints do in the temple. And so he invented this term holy envy as a way to uh, convince people there that they should allow us to build a temple there. And in fact, he was successful and we did build a temple there. So I think whether we're talking about ancient Christians or fellow modern Christians, rather than comparing our best to their worst, we should compare our best to their best and even to have a little bit of holy envy for their best, find, find how we can appreciate it. And when we find things that we disagree with on other Christians, we should try and understand it from that position as well, try and understand how they reached the conclusions they reached. That's really the approach that we take in this book. We acknowledge that ancient Christians don't always hold views that, that we accept as Latter-day Saints, but we try and approach them from that position, try and understand how they reached those views, even if they differ from us, and try and appreciate how they got there. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Study Center is a great place for you to check out. Since we've been talking about the New Testament and early Christianity in this episode, the RSC has recently published a new book that I'd like to bring your attention to called Learn of Me, History and Teachings of the New Testament, edited by John Hilton III and Nicholas Frederick from BYU Ancient Scripture. This volume of collected essays is intended to assist disciples of Christ in coming to a deeper understanding of the Savior and his ministry through their personal study of the New Testament. Because the period and culture of the New Testament can be daunting to modern readers, the editors gathered the work of Latter-day Saint scholars who have devoted time and research to gaining a greater understanding of the New Testament. Some of these essays are overtly devotional, while others are more explicitly academic, but all are written with the intent to help each of us accomplish one goal, to learn of him. Again, the book is called Learn of Me, History and Teachings of the New Testament. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Dr. Jason Combs from BYU's Department of Ancient Scripture discuss from his new edited book called Ancient Christians. In part two of Why Religion, we typically explore a little bit more about the relevance of the research publication. So in this part, Professor Combs will discuss his second chapter in this volume on how ancient Christians define the nature of God. He will analyze what led up to the Nicene Creed, discussing what parts agree with LDS doctrine, which don't, and why this matters. <laughs> 
As we now shift into the second segment of the interview, I want to pivot actually to the other chapter, um, which you've entitled The Divine Nature of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You begin the chapter by introducing readers to how some of the ancient Christians were grappling with the concept of Christology, something that you and I discussed uh, previously on this podcast. Many of our listeners are, are likely familiar with the Nicene Creed, and so I'm hoping we can use that as kind of a point of emphasis uh, in this part of the conversation. I realize there are so many places you could go with this, and with limited time, I want to make sure you have flexibility to address the parts that you feel are most relevant for our audience. So in whatever way you feel uh, is best, maybe remind us of some of these debates that were happening um, and and the the point of the Nicene Creed and, and how that uh, the purpose of it was in part to address some of these debates. The Council of Nicaea was really brought together for, well, for a number of purposes. But two of those purposes were, one, to refute the position of a Christian uh, named Arius, who argued that Jesus was not fully divine in the same way that God the Father was fully divine, that Jesus was subordinate to the Father. And also, as the uh, another purpose of the Nicene Creed was to summarize the essential teachings of Christianity. Uh, because prior to the time of the Nicene Creed, uh, early Christians were spread throughout the Roman Empire. They were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. They did not have backing from the empire. They were not considered a legal religion. And so they didn't have a lot of communication between the different groups of Christianity throughout the empire. So each of them had to come to their own conclusions about what are the essential beliefs a convert to the church must affirm before they are baptized. Well, by the time of the Nicene Creed, uh, Constantine had come on the scene, the Emperor Constantine, and he had declared Christianity an official religion of the Roman Empire. Not, not yet the official religion, but one of the official religions of the Roman Empire. And because of that, Christians could now meet. And Constantine allowed them and, and, and brought them together at this Council of Nicaea in order to have a discussion about what are the core teachings of Christianity. And so those are some of the purposes that led to the Council of Nicaea. Now, if we read the Nicene Creed, I'm opening up, to it right now. I've got a, a translation of it in, in this chapter. Um, much of the Nicene Creed should sound very familiar to us, and we should be very comfortable with it. The Nicene Creed begins, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of all things, visible and invisible, and one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, that's language straight out of Scripture. And in fact, uh, not only straight out of the Bible, but straight out of Restoration Scripture. Uh, there's an article that uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Lincoln Blumel, wrote, uh, an excellent article on the Nicene Creed in a book called Standing Apart, uh, where he shows uh, step by step how the Nicene Creed agrees not only with the Bible, but also with Restoration Scripture, the, Bi the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price. And so, so much of what's in here is, is simply a summary of Scripture. Now, the part that we often turn to as Latter-day Saints and say, whoa, what's going on here? This is not in Scripture, uh, is where it tries to describe the nature of God the Father and the Son in relationship to each other. And, and it does so like this. It says, as it's describing Jesus Christ as the only begotten, it goes on to define what it means for Jesus Christ to be the only begotten in this way. It says, he is out of the essence of the Father. The Greek word there is usia. For that's what I'm translating as essence. It could also be translated as substance. Out of the essence of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, consubstantial or same essence with the Father. Uh, the word translated there as consubstantial or same essence is homoousios. And that's the word that doesn't appear in Scripture and that we tend to get a little uncomfortable with. Let me say two things about that. One, when we today read a statement like this, that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father, we tend to misinterpret it as early Christians saying that God the Father and Jesus Christ are one person. Early Christians did not believe that. Early Christians, in fact, declared that view to be a heresy. It was a heresy called modalism or monar monarchianism, 
uh, that I talk about a little bit more in this chapter. Uh, the heresy was the belief that God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are all one person uh, who present themselves in different modes at different times. So there is one God who sometimes represents himself in the mode of the Father, other times in the mode of the Son, other times in the mode of the Holy Spirit. And that's why this heresy is called modalism. And so what you're saying is that is not what that they is were That is not what they are saying. And in fact, that is clarified even further in a later creed, uh, or not a later creed, in a later council, uh, the Council of Chalcedon that issues a definition where it makes it clear that God the that God the Father and Jesus Christ are consubstantial, but that Jesus Christ is also consubstantial with humanity. Here's how it reads. This is the the Chalcedonian definition that comes from 451 A.D. Um, I'm going to start where it's describing Jesus Christ as truly God. So, uh, truly God, the same truly human, of rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father as regards his divinity, and the same consubstantial with us as regards his humanity, like us in all things apart from sin. So, when they say consubstantial, they're not saying that God the Father and Jesus Christ are the same person any more than they're saying that Jesus Christ is the same person with all of us human beings. What they're saying is that Jesus Christ has the same nature as the Father, meaning that both are divine. Both are equally God. Now, the other thing I wanted to say about this is that early Christians, when they talked about the nature of God, they saw God as having a nature very different than human nature. We would agree with them to a degree on this. We would agree that we are not like God because we are sinful. We are not like God because God is perfect and glorious and exalted, and we are none of those. Uh, early Christians took it a step further to say almost that we are different, a different species from God. We God created us, therefore we are creatures, and God begot, God the Father begot Jesus Christ, and therefore Jesus Christ is similar to the Father. An analogy would be, think of a, uh, somebody who makes pots, so a potter, a potter creates a pot, but begets a son. And that son is going to grow up to be much more like the potter than a pot ever would. And so from the view of many early Christians, God the Father created us human beings, but begat Jesus Christ, who then takes on the nature of us human beings in order to exalt us to become more like the Father. Very good. There are so many other things that you can talk about with regard to the Nicene Creed and also some of the other councils and creeds that came after that. Um, maybe in the and 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 if you want to tie in any of those other thoughts, I'd I'd love to hear it. But I want to focus specifically on um, one of the phrases that that you suggest is one that troubles uh, many Latter Day Saints, and that's uh, God is without body parts and passions. So yeah. I was fascinated and intrigued by how you address this, both in contextualizing that phrase, but then helping us to see what some of earlier Christians were were trying to address when they spoke about God as being passionate. So help us understand that, because I, I was it was one of my favorite parts of the the chapter that you wrote. Yeah. So so the statement that God is without body parts and passions doesn't actually become a Christian creed until much, much later, long after the the years or the the centuries that we're focusing on in this book. Is it like a thousand years later? Yeah, yeah. Years? The first time it shows up in a in a Christian creed is actually in the Lutheran Osberg Confession. Uh that's in 1530. Um Nevertheless, early Christians did start talking about these ideas, even though it was never part of a creed until much later. So, yeah, let's let's talk a little about how early Christians began to talk about the idea that God was without passions or that God doesn't have a body. Um, it actually comes from early Christians dealing with uh, explaining the nature of God uh, from a Christian perspective— uh, to those who did not share Christian faith, to those who were pagans. Uh, within their culture at the time, there were lots of people who believed in the gods of the um, of, of the Greeks and Romans, gods like Zeus or Jupiter, right? Um, and in that context, Christians had a lot of explaining to do to say how their god was different, how our god was different. 
And so one of the ways of, di- of drawing a distinction between God the Father and, say, Zeus was to talk about the difference in terms of how they related to passions. And so when early Christians were arguing that God the Father is without passions, they were not saying that God is beyond feeling or without feeling. So he doesn't love, he doesn't care. He's right, not right. They weren't saying that. They were saying that God is not controlled by his passions the way that Zeus is. If you're familiar with any of the, the ancient Greek and Roman myths, uh, the gods are constantly being controlled out of by their passions. They're acting out of lust or anger or envy. And the Christian message was, no, that's that's not what our God is like. Our God may sometimes exhibit righteous anger, but he is not dominated or controlled by, by uncontrollable rage, right? Um, uh, let me give you an example of how Christians talked about this. There's a, a Christian named John Chrysostom uh, writing around 370, and here's what he had to say about, about this belief. He said, for if the wrath of God were a passion, meaning if God was acting out of uncontrollable rage, one might well despair as being unable to quench the flame which he had kindled by so many evil doings. In other words, if, if our God cannot control his rage or anger and we believe that God is offended by sin, then any sin we commit would lead to God being with God hating us, right? And so Chrysostom goes on, but since the divine nature is unimpassioned, meaning not controlled by rage, even if he punishes, he does not that he, he he does this not with wrath, but with tender care, with much loving kindness. Therefore, we should be of much good courage and trust in the power of repentance. So I, I just love that. So the idea is that because God is not controlled by his passions, he is open, he is he is controlled by his love. He he is open to forgiving us and to welcoming, welcoming us back into his presence. Let, let me say something about um, the, the early Christian discussions about the nature of God's body. Yeah, please. Uh, because that was one of the other issues that becomes part of this much later Protestant creed, that God is, is without body par- and parts. Um, that actually comes from Christians reading their scriptures. Uh, today, as Latter-day Saints, when we read our scriptures, we've got, of course, the, the revelation in Doctrine and Covenants that makes it very clear uh, that, that God the Father has a body, a tangible body of flesh and bones, as does the Son, even though they are glorified. And so because of that, when we read our scriptures, we read passages like Genesis uh, chapter 1, where it talks about humans being created in the image and likeness of God. And we say, oh, of course, uh, therefore God looks something like us because we're created as image and likeness. Or we read the passage in Exodus 33 where uh, where God speaks to Moses face to face. And we say, well, of course, God has a face. And so early Christians did the same thing. They turned to their scriptures to understand what God looked like. But these are not the only passage, passages in Scripture that describe what God looks like. There's a passage in Psalms 91 that describes God having wings and feathers. Uh, there's a passage in Isaiah 66 that describes God as though God were a giant. There's a passage in John 4, uh, 424 that describes God as a spirit. Uh, in, in Hebrews 12, God is a consuming fire. Now, of course, we read those and we say, oh, well, those are that's metaphor, right? Uh, but it wasn't always clear to early Christians which of these passages were metaphor and which were literal descriptions of God. And so they had to figure that out. And one of the ways they figured that out is through an approach to Scripture that is called apophatic theology. Apophatic theology is a theology of negation, a theology of describing God by describing what God is not. And so... Uh, the logic goes, if God's ways are higher than our ways, and if we can describe what a body is like, therefore God must not have a body. Now, that's an oversimplification. And there were lots of early Christians that thought that God did, in fact, have a tangible body. And some of them used philosophy to demonstrate that. 
Uh, Tertullian, for instance, insisted that God had a body and used Stoic philosophy to make arguments about that. Another Christian named Origen of Alexandria argued that God did not have a body, and he and his views sometimes sound like uh, the philosophy of Plato as it had developed in the time of Origen. And so we need to be, sometimes as Latter-day Saints, we say, oh, philosophy corrupted the Christian notion of God. Uh, it's actually a little more complicated than that, uh, because Christians who are arguing that God did have a body, their views were similar to philosophy as well. So we need to take each of these on their own terms and realize that Christians were developing their views by reading scripture and trying to make sense of which scripture must be metaphorical, which must be literal. As Latter-day Saints, we're blessed with additional scripture that makes it very clear that God has a tangible body. Nevertheless, I still think we can appreciate how Christians were trying to worship God uh, through this apophatic theology by saying God must be so grand, so great, these beyond our ability to describe what he is like. And with that caution in mind, any any other implications you see for Latter-day Saints from uh, this chapter and the work you've done here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, for for one, I think uh, when, when Latter-day Saints hear the term Trinity, we often cringe and we say, oh, that, that term's not scriptural. Why, why do other Christians use it? And we sometimes assume that the term Trinity means that God, uh, it, it, it suggests the view that God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are one person. But once again, that's heresy. That's a heresy called modalism. And in fact, the term Trinity was first used by a Christian named Tertullian as he was arguing against the view called modalism. And so the term Trinity actually describes God as a triunity, as, as three who are one in purpose. And so, uh, so we need to be careful dismissing the term Trinity, uh, and we need to be careful assuming that Trinity means something that it does not, in fact, mean. Uh, in fact, um, I, I, I've... I just described Trinity as being uh, Tertullian's belief that God is, in fact, three persons who are one in purpose. Uh, we, that's another term that we need to be somewhat caref careful with, uh, the term person. Um, as Latter-day Saints, sometimes we say that we believe that God is three different beings because we are using the term being and the word person as if they're synonymous. But early Christians from the time of the Nicene Creed on, and even Christians today, use the term person and being in very different ways. They use the term being to describe div God's divine nature. And so when other Christians hear us say something like God is three separate beings, they don't hear us saying God is three separate persons. They hear us saying that God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost are three different natures, that they're not all God. And that they have three different purposes and that they act independently of each other. And that's not what we believe at all. So we need to be much more careful in, in it, can, it can help us, it can actually benefit us to be more familiar with what other Christians teach about this. And therefore, um, it can help us to better communicate our own beliefs to other Christians. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland gave a talk to mission presidents a number of years ago uh, where he, in fact, is very careful to use the term persons when describing God as three separate persons. And he goes on to acknowledge that uh, Latter-day Saints have, have received criticism for presenting our views of God in a way that does not accurately represent what we believe to other Christians. He points out that sometimes we've emphasized the threeness of God to such an extreme and, and neglected emphasizing the oneness of God and, and other Christians have not understood what we believe because of that. So we need to be much more careful in how we represent uh, what we believe. And, and being more familiar with the history of Christianity that I lay out in this book, uh, and in particular in this chapter about the nature of God, can help us to better communicate our views to others. If you're interested in reading Jason Combs and his colleagues' wonderful work in the new book, Ancient Christians, An Introduction for Latter-day Saints, we have included a link to it on our website. And if you've enjoyed learning from Dr. Jason Combs, I would highly recommend 
you listen to his previous Why Religion episode that was referenced in this interview, episode number 37, called The Humanity and Divinity of Jesus Christ. It's a really insightful and touching episode where he expands on some of the points that he discussed in part two of this interview. Okay, we've arrived at our last segment, part three of Why Religion, where we like to get a little bit more personal. In this last segment, Jason will share with us how his studies of early Christians has deepened his faith as a current disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to transition now to the the third and final segment of the interview, and that's where we get a little more personal. Uh, Against that backdrop, I want to actually read the opening lines from the preface of the volume and then ask a, a question. In the preface, it says, Every contributor to this volume could tell a story of how each was led to the study of the New Testament and early Christianity through a series of spiritual promptings. They all felt called to the work. As the editors of this volume, we also heard the call, and in large part, this book is a natural outgrowth of our desire to respond to that call. So my question to you is, what is your story? How were you led to a study of New Testament and early Christianity? Great. Yeah. Um, Well, I I suppose that really started with my conversion to the church. Um, I... uh, I joined the church uh, when I turned 18, but but started attending when I was uh, 15, turning 16. And um, at the time, uh, I was really struggling in high school. Um, I didn't find out until much, much later that I have attention deficit disorder. So uh, homework was never my thing. Uh, and so when I, when I met some friends who were members of the church and they invited me to read the Book of Mormon, for instance, uh, my response was, no way. <laughs> I'm not reading that thing. That is way too long. I don't even read my homework. What makes you think I'm going to read a book that long? Um, and, uh, and the person who invited me to read the Book of Mormon, she was quick on her feet. She's all, she, she responded, it's all right. I've got the book on cassette. You can, you can listen to it. Uh, so that was my original exposure to the Book of Mormon. But um, after that, I began to read it a little bit every day. And as I – the best way to describe it is as as the Spirit caught hold of me, uh, it, it birthed within me this love of learning. I wanted to understand the Book of Mormon more. Uh, these, these same friends also invited me to attend seminary and it just so happened that the year of seminary I began attending was the Old Testament year. So I attended both the Old Testament year and the New Testament year. So part of my conversion was learning about the Bible and I just wanted to know more and more. So when I graduated high school and began attending a local community college, I I attended all the institute classes I possibly could. I discovered the Institute had a small library full of books written by Latter-day Saints about different topics related to the scriptures and and other things. And and so I'd spend hours in there combing through the books. And and then when I arrived at Brigham Young University, I discovered this major called Ancient Near Eastern Studies and realized there was even more to learn about the context surrounding the Bible and that that could help me to understand the Bible more. after graduating with a major in, in Near Eastern Studies and then going on to Yale Divinity School, I, I really uh, – that was really the first time I encountered and learned to love uh, ancient Christians outside of the New Testament. And just uh, as a Latter-day Saint, I was sort of surprised to learn that there was so much early Christians had written outside the New Testament. I, I'd sort of assumed that not much happened after the New Testament, at least up until the time of the Protestant Reformation and definitely until the time of Joseph Smith. Uh, so I was just surprised uh, to learn that there was so much information out there that that early Christians had written so much and um, I fell in love with with reading uh, their words and and uh, and exploring all that they had to teach us. That's so good. Thank you for that that background. I'm interested in in learning a little bit more about your personal journey as a disciple of Christ. Many of us experience kind of a plateau in scripture studies uh, where sometimes they're more meaningful than others, and and this comes and goes. I'm I, I want to know. 
what have you learned that keeps this vitality in your Scripture study, that keeps you having that same hunger that you had as a teenager engaging with the Word of God, you know, for the first time? What, what keeps that fire burning? I think I can answer that in a couple of different ways. L- let me start by, by going back to the story I shared. As I joined the church, as I learned more and more about the church, that, that really fueled within me this hunger to know more. Every, every time I learned a little something more, I discovered that there was so much more to learn. And so simply being open to the possibility that, that there is always more to learn has helped me to always learn more. I can share some really specific things, too. Um, In terms of Scripture study, I think it can help to change up the way we study Scriptures now and again. Uh, Let me give you an example from my mission. At one point during my mission, I decided, you know what? I I need to immerse myself more in the Scriptures that I'm currently doing. And so I started keeping a Scripture journal in which I began at the start of the Book of Mormon, 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1, and I decided I am not going to leave that verse until I learn something new. And so I spent some time studying that verse and, and looking up comparable passages in other parts of Scripture and seeing how all those words were used in other parts of Scripture and wrote up a little summary of, of everything I found and then moved on to 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 2 and said, I'm not going to leave this verse until I learn something new about what, what is being written. My, my whole approach was based on the idea that if it was so difficult for Nephi, for Mormon, for Moroni to wa- write these words on, on the plates, then every word must be really important. And so I started to approach the Book of Mormon for that. And, and I've gone back to that approach now and again. I have not stuck with it all the way to the end of the Book of Mormon. Because once again, I think it can be helpful to vary our approaches to Scripture in order to learn something new. Uh, uh, President Nelson invited us uh, a few years back to go through the Book of Mormon and mark uh, the names of Jesus and all the all the ways that that all everything that Jesus is doing in the Book of Mormon. Right? Um, that's another approach that I've I've found brings me closer to Christ. Uh, Other approaches are using other resources to understand Scripture. Uh, Sometimes the King James English in our Bibles can be kind of complicated. So I found relying on a study Bible can be very helpful. Uh, I I often use the HarperCollins Study Bible or uh, Tom Wayman's uh, The New Testament, A Translation for Latter-day Saints. Both of those I found very helpful. Uh, Josh Sears gave a great uh, Why Religion podcast a while back on study Bibles uh, based on an article he wrote for the Religious Educator called Study Bibles, an Introduction for Latter-day Saints. So using those as resources to dive deeper into Scripture, I found very helpful. Thank you so much. I, I want to ask just one final question here. In these chapters, you've done some incredible work helping your readers and our listeners challenge uh, assumptions that maybe we've had and to begin thinking about important topics in new ways. Uh, in, in what ways have your studies of those early Christians, these, these, uh, these faithful uh, individuals we've been talking about, how has that deepened your faith in Jesus Christ and in the restored gospel? That's a great question. Um, and I can answer that in a number of ways. One of the ways is by engaging with early Christian, let me just take the the chapter we were just talking about on the nature of God. By reading what early Christians wrote about the nature of God and how they were reading their scriptures to understand the relationship between God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and the importance of Jesus Christ having both a divine nature and a human nature, and how those related to each other, I found myself asking new questions of our own scripture. Uh, for instance, I, I after studying this, I was reading in Doctrine and Covenant 76, where it talks about all of us as being begotten sons and daughters unto God. And I found myself asking, okay, what, what does that mean when Joe Smith wrote that? Was he talking about our begottenness in terms of uh, the way that King Benjamin talks about it, when he talks about us being begotten sons and daughters to Christ through the atonement of Jesus Christ? 
Or is he talking about how God the Father created us as spirit children? And if, if in fact, he's talking about us as begotten from God the Father, what does that mean about our relationship to Jesus Christ as begotten? Uh, these are questions that I don't have simple answers to, but they're questions that have fueled new interests and, and new seeking for me, that has made me go back to my scriptures and to read things in, in new light and, and to think about things in new ways. Um, so that's one of the ways in which reading the thoughts of ancient Christians has fueled my, my love of learning and my love of the restoration. Another way is just seeing parallels between the lives of ancient Christians and, and our own journey today. For instance, when I read the beginning of Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trypho the Jew, uh, where Justin Martyr lays out his conversion story, it really resonates with me hearing how he was searching uh, from one philosophy to the next to try and find truth. And it wasn't until he discovered Christianity that he found fulfillment. Or reading the story of the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas, where a Christian named Perpetua has been imprisoned for being a Christian, for her refusal to deny Jesus Christ. And I hear resonances in that of the words of Moroni at the beginning of Moroni, where he's being hunted by the Lamanites and says, nevertheless, I will not deny the Christ. There are so many stories that are just so beautiful of our ancient Christian ancestors that we can relate to and learn from. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Mitchell Bashford. Say hi, Mitchell. Hi, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.